In this episode, we are going to build a word level language model using a recurrent neural network. Most of this notebook is based on an example from Sebastian Rashka's book, Machine Learning with PyTorch and Scikit-Learn. He has here a character level RNN, uh, but what we're doing here, we're changing this basic example to do something a little bit more uh, sophisticated with a word level RNN. So let's do all of our imports. And before we proceed, I should say that we are using, or I am using a V100 GPU because the data set and the model is a little bit big. I think you should still be able to run these on a free tier with the T4 GPU. Just give it a try. So we need a data set to train our model. Here I'm using fairy tales because they have very simple language or probably simpler language. And so it should be easier for the RNN to pick up the patterns in that language. On top of this, I have further cleared or cleaned the data set by limiting it to sentences which only contain the top 5,000 words. So I am essentially limiting the vocabulary size to around 5,000 tokens. And again, this ensures that it is easier for our model to pick up all the patterns. I've also cleaned the data set uh, additionally by removing a needed punctuation and removing sentences which have a more complex structure in particular, I have removed any sentence that contains quoted speech. And again, this makes the model, uh, this makes the patterns in the data set easier for the model to learn. If you scroll to the end of this notebook, you can see the function that I used to process the data set. So let's go ahead, download this and take a look at its contents. There are over 2 million uh, characters in here, but obviously we're not really interested in characters because we want to do word level tokenization. So we have a tokenize function, which is taking the stream of text and returning a list of tokens. So if we run this on our data set, we can take a look at the first 100 tokens, and you can see here, D is one token, Happy Prince, and that's the title of the first uh, tail in this data set. And then you can see there is a period and the rest of the story, high above the city, on a tall column stood the statue of the Happy Prince, and so on. Now, the data set is not too big, but you have uh, quite a few tokens in it. And again, this is the size of the vocabulary, the unique tokens in the data set. We want to take that vocabulary, all the tokens in the vocabulary, and give each of them an index so that later on we can one hot encode uh, each of the tokens before we feed them into the model. So we create the vocabulary object with a sorted set. And then we have some Python here, essentially to implement these lookup tables. So word to index will implement a lookup table where we feed a word and it returns the index. And then we have a word array in um, NumPy, which makes it easier given an index or a series of indices to uh, return the actual tokens or words associated with them. Let me run the cell and we can see, for example, that we have these tokens here, the happy prince, and then this is the <coughs> and then this is the encoded version of uh, that particular sentence. And obviously we can do the reverse. We can feed into these some tokens and it can return the actual sentence. Now, as we said, this is unsupervised learning. We just have a stream of text and we need to process it, transforming it into labeled data. 
And what we do, we're gonna take sentences from the data set, as you can see here on the right side, and we are gonna pair them with the target sequence, which is basically the sentence shifted by one. So what we do, we set a sequence length, in this case 50, and then we set a chunk size 50 plus one, so that we can do this uh, association. So this divides the text into chunks. Let me just run the cell so you can see the, uh, the chunks. And then we create a PyTorch data set, which is essentially going to be a wrapper of this data set. And as you can see, essentially what we're doing, we're implementing get index. It takes an ID. It retrieves the chunk. Remember, this chunk is going to be 51 words or 51 tokens long. And then we are returning the X here as all the tokens up to the 50th token. And then we're returning the target sequence or the Y uh, starting from the second token up to the end. So again, we're simply implementing this and you can see these in practice, we are just going to extract uh, two uh, samples from this data set and you can see the input sequence and the target uh, sequence just shifted by one. And then we are obviously wrapping everything into a PyTorch data loader with a batch size of 64. And as usual, we will ask PyTorch to shuffle these batches. So now we are ready to create the PyTorch model. What you're looking at here is essentially the model we will create. So we are going to have an embedding layer, which is going to take the tokens, one hot encode them, uh, and then it's going to output the embeddings. Then the embeddings are going to go into a recurrent layer. So you see here the recurrence and this recurrent layer is further going to feed into a final fully connected layer, which is going to take the output size of the recurrent layer and map it into the vocabulary space. So if you look at this, it's probably better to visualize it. The final layer returns the logits this is the size of the vocabulary. The entire output is going to be transformed into a probability distribution across all the tokens so that we can look at the most likely subsequent token. So that's what that model looks like. So we have an embedding layer that PyTorch provides us. We could do this by hand just by one hot encoding uh, whatever comes in and then having a multi-layer perceptron to project it into the embeddings but PyTorch does it for us and it is more efficient. So obviously the size of the embedding, the input size of the embedding layer is the size of the vocabulary and then the output size is the embedding dimension. This feeds into an RNN, it's an LSTM layer, long short-term memory cell. Uh, you shouldn't even try to do this without standard RNN, they just can't remember enough to capture any uh, meaningful pattern here. And you can see that this LSTM uh, then uh, outputs the hidden size and we select batch first here. Uh, it's easier to, to work with. And then we have the final fully connected layer, which goes from the batch size back into the vocabulary size. This is the forward pass, exactly as uh, all the other forward passes that we have seen. The only thing to mention here is the um, hidden state and the uh, cell state that obviously we have to keep track of as we are going through each time sequence every time we call the um, recurrent network. And then we also have a utility function to initialize the hidden state and the cell states with zeros 
for every item in the batch. Now we instantiate this model and we select 256 as the embedding dimension and 512 as the hidden uh, layer size. So that's our model. And now we are ready to train it. But before we train it, I want to show you how the model is performing right now. So I'm just going to jump to the text generation. So this generate method here. And obviously the way it works, we give the model a seed sentence and then we keep calling it generating the next character. So let's see what it does at the moment. So I call the generate method on the untrained model. So this is just a bunch of random weights. And let's see what it generates. He did what? That's our seed. And then says Mary, wasted, princesses, dead, post, volume, succeed, and so on. These are just random words. Obviously, the model has learned nothing. Hopefully, after we train it, this model will have uh, learned some structures and will say something more coherent than this. We are now ready to train the model. This is very similar to any other uh, training loop that we've implemented. So we are going to use cross entropy loss and Adam as an optimizer. We are initially going to train these for 10,000 epochs. And here we're using the term epoch a little bit loosely. Uh, typically an epoch is a run over the entire training set. Uh, in this case, an epoch is simply going to be a run over one batch in the uh, training set. So we start an epoch by initializing the hidden state and the cell states to zeros. We sample a random batch from the training set. We move it to the GPU. And then for every token in that sequence of 50 tokens, we pass that token to the model together with the hidden and cell states. We look at the prediction and we compare it with the target value that we are expecting. So we compute the loss and we accumulate this loss in this variable. At the end of the sequence, we can use backward to compute the derivatives for all of these uh, losses that we have calculated. And then we use step from the Adam optimizer to adjust the values of the weights so that the model better uh, mimics or um, better adapts to the data that we are expecting. Let's run this and you can see that the loss is quite high at the beginning. Hopefully it is going to come down. Now, even if I'm training these on a V100, uh, it is going to take some time uh, for it to complete. So I'm going to see you in a, in a bit. The model has finished training and we can see that the loss kind of consistently went down, but let's take a look in practice at how the model does. So if you recall, when we tried to complete this sentence at the very beginning, it just gave us a random set of words. Let's try again and see what this looks like. He did what the remarkable rocket, mm, not too good. This was just what he said. Oh, now that is a perfectly coherent sentence. It was not long before the sun left that mm, kind of coherent. I mean, the grammar is definitely there, uh, but one foot was just alive in the world and so many years it would be better to have and so on. You can see that it is considerably better. Obviously we haven't trained it for long enough. What I'm going to do at the end of this video, I'm probably going to run this training for a little bit longer. Something else to mention here is that we are not always choosing the uh, token with the highest probability. We did discuss using something called temperature and top P sampling. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We are applying a temperature to the logits that come out of the model. And this obviously changes the 
probability distribution, a low temperature makes that probability distribution sharper, so there will be less high probability tokens, whereas a higher temperature flattens that probability distribution, so we will have many more tokens to uh, sample from. And then the top P sampling restricts the set of tokens we sample from uh, to a certain uh, percentage, uh, sorry, to a certain probability ceiling. And that's all implemented, implemented here. So you can see that uh, every time we run this, obviously we get a uh, different sentence. He did what he might be now as the ball rolling down in the middle of her feet and his legs would suit him. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not really sure about this sentence here, uh, but again, we can run it again and we get a totally different completion. Uh, this is quite a good one. I am the innocent friend. He did what he could do was not to have caught after him. Mm, not great. Now, I wanted to also show you the embeddings. We saw that the embedding layer is essentially used to take the tokens, one hot encode them, and then project them into a smaller space. And the idea is that after learning, these embeddings will have captured some something about the individual tokens of the language, and the tokens will cluster together if they share meaningful semantic or context, uh, at least for from what the model has learned in the training data. And we can see that uh, by looking at how close certain tokens are. Now, whenever you have these embeddings, you can see how far away they are. And you've got typically two ways of doing that. You've got the Euclidean distance of these vectors, and then you've also got the cosine similarity. Now, here I have a method that uh, calculates the distance uh, between vectors using cosine similarity. So let's say we have the token she. If we check these are the 10 closer tokens to in the embedding space to the word she. So we've got he kind of makes sense. Uh, Proserpina, that's a female name, so that makes sense. Woman, Amy, uh, so these are all related. We can look for he, and obviously uh, we have she. Uh, not really sure about some of these, but obviously Jason would be close to that. Uh, some other pronouns would be uh, close to that. So you can see how these embedding has actually learned some relationships between all the different words or tokens in our dictionary.